Wow. She should be my life coach. <laughs> Every time I do a pep talk, I'm gonna call her up. How's everybody doing? It's great to see you. I've been on tour for the last three weeks and just got home yesterday. Um, this book came out actually the day that Harper Lee's new book came out, <laughs> which is something I really highly recommend. <laughs> I'm going to tell my publisher that when my next novel comes out, I want it to be when the new Shakespeare drops. <laughs> yeah. Really boost sales. Uh, tour's good, and tours can be sometimes bad. Good tour. Uh, when I was in Portland, I was there the day after Jimmy Carter went through on tour. So on the marquee, it said, Jimmy Carter, Josh Moore. So I could text it to my mom and be like, see, mom? <laughs> I do stuff. Well, stuff. Stuff happens. That's good. Um, yeah, that'll be like the most presidential my life ever gets. Just, just a one little marquee. The bad tour was yesterday because I had been sort of kind of subsisting on these one way plane tickets. And I forgot to get a plane ticket home <laughs> yesterday. So most of you probably champion uh, direct travel, um, which, you know, has its place. But yesterday, I discovered the um, infamous LaGuardia to Dallas, oh. Dallas to LA, and LA to San Francisco. So why take five hours when, when nine and a half is an option? Uh, that's, that's great. I had a super good time. Uh, the new book is called All This Life. Uh, I'll, I'll read from the beginning, so I don't really need to, to tell you too much about it. Uh, it's a book about kind of the unification of our, our analog and our digital identities. You know, historically, we only had to be worried about our real lives, uh, but in the 21st century, we all know that that's not the case. It's another brutal day, all of them inching over the Golden Gate Bridge into San Francisco, their typical trek to cluttered desks, schlepping with their hangovers, their NPR, carpools and podcasts, prescription pills and nicotine patches, their high-def depressions, LASIK so they can see all their designer disaffections, lipstick smeared on bleach teeth, bags under their eyes or Botox time machines, bald spots or slick dye jobs, bellies wedged in pants or carved Pilates bodies, their urges to call in sick, their woulda, coulda, shouldas, more rationalizations and regrets running through the air in cell signals. No one wants to get to work. <laughs> Even those claiming to enjoy their jobs still bristle at the idea of oozing into ergonomic chairs, reviving computer screens, feeling the day's flickering chaos erupt on their faces. A couple extra hours of sleep. A half day, telecommuting, something other than the full slog the particulars of their job don't even matter because all the variables lead to one delicate plea. Please give us a day off. <laughs> a day to ourselves, a day to feel free, a day to be alive. But this is a morning without such currency. And so there they sit, in their hybrids and these sports cars and family sedans, eking a couple toes on the accelerator before hitting the brake again. Bumper to bumper, a Bluetooth chain gang. The posted speed limit is 45, which is a brutal joke at this time of the day. It should say four or five. <laughs> Somebody has to fix that conjunctionless sign. Not only does the speed limit tease, so does the traffic zooming out of San Francisco, motoring next to them, by them, zipping right along at the 45 mile per hour clip. That drew some sighs from our commuters, pining for U-turns and quick getaways and sordid adventures. A white Prius houses a father and his 14-year-old son, they keep away from each other in the morning, or rather Jake keeps away from his dad, his surly chauffeur. Jake knows the sad hierarchy, a Google search of his father's favorite things would not return the boy as a page one result. 
Oh. Jake has never understood what makes his father so moody as they drive in together. And yet there's really no way his dad could explain it. No way for the father to unpack adult disappointment. It's impossible for the father to convey that he'd expected his life to amount to more than some middling stake in a PR firm and it's too late to fix. How can he tell his only child that commuting is a kind of daily desolation his mind always flap into the past, even when it's the last thing he wants to remember, being young. When he released his potential and passions and possibilities up into the air, free them out does. Please, are you okay? I did it. <laughs> it was, a, it was a, my, the clout of my prose. <laughs> so everybody beware. No one's safe. <laughs> you good? Should we do it? Do it. Um, what was I even talking about? Oh, right, he was being young. We're talking about the father, right? Okay. When he released his potential and passions and possibilities up into the air, freeing them like doves, his whole life ahead to watch all his dreams come true. How can he tell his son that becoming an adult is learning to live with your failures? Learning to dodge these dying birds as they thump back to earth. How do you say that to your boy? Jake, never trying to disrupt their frail truth, spends his time filming things out the window with his iPhone. Stealing frames from people's lives, poaching and posting them online, his pieces of property. Yesterday, he captured a woman flossing her teeth while steering with her elbows. <laughs> the day before, a guy with little scissors trimming his mustache like a bonsai tree. So far, today's material has been a bunch of stinkers, but this is when Jake sees the brass band. They're just coming onto the bridge's walkway on the San Francisco side by the toll booths. They're moving toward Jake, playing their instruments, forming a roaming pack. Jake counts 12 of them, three trumpet players, two saxophones, two clarinets, two trombones, a snare drum, a bass drum, and a tuba player. They're all done up in wild outfits, clothed in mismatched prints and patterns and clashing colors. The brass band plays its song and moves in its inhaling and exhaling choreography, and then one of the trumpet players, a man, breaks free from the formation, moving over to the bridge's orange railing, throwing his trumpet over the side, climbing the rail, folding his hands in prayer, leaping toward the ocean. Jake watches and records, records and watches, and it's not really happening. There's no way this is really happening, so he keeps filming the brass band, stops its forward progress. Jake has to crane his head backward to watch it through the car's back window because his father's ride itches toward the toll plaza. The brass band staying huddled, keeping its music going. Then another runs from the pack throwing her clarinet and heaving her body over the side. Then another trumpet player jumps. Then one of the saxophonists. Then a trombonist. They're dying, Dad, says Jake. So that's sort of a... Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. That's not... That is totally not true. Yeah. That's sort of like a, a truncated version of the opening chapter. Uh, and from there, the book reads like one of those cool old Robert, Robert Altman flicks from the 70s, in which we have seven or eight main characters, and all the storylines seem disparate at first, and yet they all sort of converge as the book nears um, its climax. And I want to just read one other kind of little paragraph toward the end um, from one of the principal characters, and her name is Kathleen. Uh, I think this is a nice note for us to end our time together on. Uh, and you, you know, hold on to your chairs, because this is pretty fucking good. <laughs> <laughs> Caricatures. 
avatars, usernames, however humans present themselves, whatever we are, there is one thing Kathleen knows. We are all scared. We are haunted by yesterday and terrified of tomorrow. It's this life, all this life, and we are frightened of it. There are addictions and relapses. There are weather balloons and wars, sociopaths and estrangements. There's climate change, mental illness, mood disorders. There are families assembling and dissembling. There are dubious genes dripping down. There are more strains of violence than the flu. The particulars of human misery are limitless. A rising ocean of humiliations and blues, too low paychecks and pipe dreams. People cling so hard to so little, everything eroding a little more every day. It's enough to make you pour whiskey on an open wound. But that's what we have to endure. Kathleen now knows that we need the scars on our skin before the tattoos envelop that ugly. We need those stakes stacked so high that we're lost in order to understand that it's okay to be lost. We will always be lost. We are the walking wounded, and there's love in our hearts. Thank you.